Welcome back to the Project Censored Show on Pacifica Radio. I'm Mickey Huff. In this segment, we are joined by my co-host, Eleanor Goldfield. And we've done this before, so listeners of the program know that sometimes Eleanor and I join forces to talk about the state of our free press or the sordid state of our so-called free press. Uh, we also have a, a segment we're going to talk about with Eleanor, uh, a recent piece that she wrote for Truth Out. It's over at truthout.org on the unhoused crisis. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about one of the stories in Top 25 and certainly hear from Eleanor about her experiences around this issue. But Eleanor, before we get into that, let's talk a little about the state of the so-called free press. Um, there's been a lot of uh, a lot more reporting in the last week or so that is deconstructing the New York Times piece from late last year that uh, was drumming up the Hamas rape story from the October 7 attacks. Uh, that's, of course, been challenged and debunked by numerous sources, uh, including more recently uh, over at The Intercept. And of course, our colleague Robin Anderson had written about this. We've addressed this before. But uh, Eleanor Goldfield, um, your thoughts on some of what's been coming out around these stories. Yeah. So first, Mickey, I want to highlight to folks that sexual assault and rape are uh, are horrific uh, war crimes that are used around the globe in times of war, but also in times of so-called peace. Uh, and they are notoriously difficult to prove. And this is also why so disgustingly they are sometimes used as false claims. Because unlike like if somebody's decapitated, it's pretty easy to see that, right? It's a very clear case. If somebody's been sexually assaulted or raped, it's difficult to prove, especially if that person then dies. It's not like you can ask them what happened. Now, with the case of the claims of of rape and sexual assault by Hamas on October 7th, the uh, as you pointed out, Mickey, several outlets covered this, uh, including the Gray Zone and uh, Robin Anderson, who's who's a frequent contributor to Project Censored. And The Intercept also published a piece just at the end of February, basically pulling together a lot of this in like a massive ex expose that's a pretty long read, uh, but an important one. And it brings together, though without credit, uh, it brings together <laughs> insight about the uh, like reporting from others about this and basically showing uh, in a very clear cut way how the New York Times just made this up by using somebody who literally like and I'm not going to go into all the details because that would take four hours. But basically, uh, but a woman who went around to crisis and rape centers around Israel and tried to find evidence of rape and couldn't. And then basically they just made it up because they couldn't find evidence of it. So they just made it up. And I just like to also highlight that this is coming from somebody who has himself pointed out that evidence is not important. Uh, and this is Jeffrey Gettleman, who's a veteran reporter at The New York Times. And he said uh, this was a, a while ago, I believe. I can't recall exactly when this was, but he was giving a speech about so-called evidence and his relationship to it. Um, and hold on. Let me find it here. Oh, OK. So he said. Uh, I don't want to use the word evidence because evidence is almost like a legal term that suggests you're trying to prove an allegation or prove a case in court. That's not my role. We all have our roles, and my role is to document, to present information, to give people a voice. And he says, and with regards to the claims, we found information along the entire chain of violence, so of sexual violence, end quote, which, no, you didn't, Gettleman. Uh, but he yeah, admits, isn't this the Pulitzer Prize winner at the Times? Uh, he's, I, I'm not sure. I know that he helped the New York Times win a Polk Award. Mm. Yeah. Um, I mean, these are, Gettleman, I mean, again, being one of the lead authors here, they brought in two other writers and it's turned out that there's been some other issues with these people. Yeah. I mean, yeah. but that's that's the New York Times, right? Like there's having no experience in journalism, having no real background, having connections to that. I mean, she, and, it's a bizarre and this story. Is, this is literally like Gettleman literally worked uh, with a, a woman, Schwartz is her last name, who who told in, an, in a podcast interview, explained her extensive efforts to get confirmation from Israeli hospitals, rape crisis centers, trauma recovery facilities and sexual assault hotlines in Israel 
and didn't get a single confirmation from one of them. That, I mean, and these are Israeli rape crisis centers and traumas. Like, these are not like anti-Zionist rape center. Like, these are, is written. so it's like, you're working with a woman who admitted that she didn't find evidence. And Gettleman's like, well, look, evidence is not what we do here. That's not my job. <laughs> it's like, well, I mean, I agree. That's obviously not your job. But how dare you then print it in the New York Times when you clearly are suggesting that you have the evidence? Well, Eleanor, this is um, this isn't new for the New York Times. I mean, you know, they they've hired people before that have just made things up whole cloth. Jason Blair, uh, they sort of turned a cottage industry. I mean, they they have contributed to the cottage industry known as RussiaGate in recent years, along with MSNBC and others. And going back far enough over 20 years, they were the ones with Judy Miller flogging the nonsensical weapons of mass destruction story over and over and over again. Um, and, you know, the atrocity propaganda, or it's almost atrocity porn at some point, the way the media tries to cover these issues and, and cover up reality in the process, goes back, at, you know, it's age old, you know, over 100 years ago, uh, you know, the... The U.S. government under the Creel Commission and the Committee on Public Information was spreading wild uh, disinformation around the U.S. public about Germans ripping the arms off of Belgian babies to get into the war. And, you know, we saw similar things in, in you know, the Cold War and Vietnam. We certainly uh, have seen it over 1989-90. We can't forget when Naira, the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador, was coached by a, a U.S. Um, public relations firm, Hill and Knowlton, to lie to Congress about babies being thrown out of incubators that George Herbert Walker Bush then repeated endlessly so that to ju justify support for that invasion. Uh, the first Gulf War, where we killed untold numbers of Iraqis, uh, the, the highway of death. Um, you know, again, more mis and disinformation being deliberately planted into the press. Uh, we then see it again around, well, again, it, they're too numerous to, to mention, but we're back to the WMD trajectory. Here we are now, October 7, turns out that Israel did was aware that there were warnings of the attacks as much as a year in advance. Um, and in fact, it looks as though that there were, there have been concerted efforts to really spin yarns and create this narrative whole cloth with what it seems like no evidence, which is where you just ended your last point, Eleanor Goldfield. Yeah, absolutely. And and I'd also like to point out, Mickey, that uh, several, I mean, the, 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 head, the headlines in the New York Times and all the other legacy media have harped on, you know, the hostages, the hostages that were taken by Hamas and how they're treated. But nobody talks about the prisoners, aka hostages, that Israel has had in jails for decades. Including and children. How, including children who have also been tortured and raped. Mm by Israeli forces. And there is documentation of that going back years. Uh, you know, UNRWA, the 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 the, uh, the mm -hmm. UN agency for Palestinian refugees has documented this very well, as well as a lot of news outlets across years. Where's the New York Times on that? If you care so much about sexual assault and rape, mm -hmm. if that's really your goal to document that, and then then where are you on that, Gettleman, <laughs> and the New York yeah. Times? <laughs> well, again, it's very selective, right? It's it's very one side. Um, it really smacks in a lot of ways of it's uh, it's OK when we or our allies do it, um, which is unfortunate. It's a really unfortunate moment for journalism, for The New York Times, in my view. Uh, it's an embarrassing situation. Fortunately, there have been uh, many people taking uh, taking notice of it, Robin Anderson being one. Of course, it's good to see the intercept piece. But of course, there have been people at Gray Zone and other places that have been rightfully um deconstructing this piece we've yet to see of course what will happen at the times but you know we we won't hold our breath about what the the alleged paper of record and the old gray lady will do about reporting such propaganda um eleanor goldfield let's shift gears at this point you recently wrote a piece uh for truthout.org titled i've been unhoused it could happen to you let's stop criminalizing it the push to criminalize the unhoused should be treated as a threat to us all. And here, of course, we live in, um, basically, we live in a glorified real estate company, an investment bank called the United States, um, where e even people of, of great means find themselves struggling to make ends meet with exorbitant rents and real estate market prices and interest rates and 
Oh my. And one of the stories we did this past year in censored 2024 on the list, nearly half of unhoused people are, un I'm sorry, nearly half of unhoused people are employed. I just wanted to segue, you know, when we ended this segment with you and 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 hear about the piece that you recently wrote, but I just wanted to give a little background on this for our listeners in case they were unaware. According to the National Alliance to End Homelessness from September of 2022, drawing on a study produced by the Becker Friedman Institute for Economics at the University of Chicago, it's reported that 53% of sheltered unhoused population and 40% of the unsheltered unhoused population were employed either part or full time from 2011 to 2018. Again, th the point of this is that it's showing, you know, the way in which that unhoused and homelessness and these things are often depicted in the corporate media are, um, it's a blight, right? And of course, out here on the left coast in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, you know, it's it's shown as, well, this is the collapse of our civilization and San Francisco is, uh, the homelessness are run, is, is running amok and it's destroying all the nice things and so forth. These peop um, people that are unhoused, again, uh, a majority of these people um, have had places to live. They they face, once, once you get into a situation, and you'll talk about this, I'm sure, Eleanor, once one gets into a situation where they're this economically unstable, um, it becomes almost impossible to get back to some place of stability to get in uh to to not just shelter but in get into you know a home and try to reconstruct one's life so uh that was story 21 and of course our listeners can go and and check that out online if they want but Eleanor let's segue to your piece from truth out can you talk a little bit about this because you also wrote this um partially from a first person perspective to you know to to, to ground this in uh in a very staunch reality Eleanor Goldfield yeah, thanks, Mickey. I think, I mean, what I wanted to do with this piece was connect issues. It's a big thing that I that I really like to to try to do is is recognize how all of these things are interlocking forms of oppression. And I think the, the, the to start here, it's to recognize that nobody can be uh, that that everybody listening to this or everybody who reads that article is one or two emergencies away from being unhoused unless you're like a trust fund kid. Uh, in which case, Mazel tov. But um, most people are one or two because there's no what safety net. You can call it whatever you want. Uh, there's no there's nothing to fall back on if you have you know medical bills. You know, 85 percent of people who went bankrupt back in 2015 due to medical expenses had insurance. So it's like we don't have even when you pay exorbitant insurance fees, there's nothing to fall back on. There's also, and so I think it's also important to recognize that the reasons that people become unhoused cannot be separated from the systems of capitalism, of racism, of sexism, uh, of colonialism, of all of these interlocking aspects of oppression. And so, you know, for me personally, I became unhoused because the situation that I had set up before I moved to LA became unsafe. And then I couldn't find anything that I could. Uh, a afford or B wanted to uh, step into because wow if I if I had a nickel for every like bananas situation that I found on Craigslist that's how we did it back in the day uh, mm -hmm. of people who were willing to have me as their housemate I I mean I'd I'd be a trust fund kid so uh, there are the, there were these interlocking reasons that created this the uh, the the reasons for why I became unhoused in 2005 and also a lot of this also has to do with the accessibility of things like shelters in LA in particular, but this is not uh, unusual. It's near, it's nearly impossible to get into a shelter. Um, and also if you have, if you have any kind of, uh, you know, issues, whether that be mental health issues, addiction issues, it's even more inaccessible. You have to be like this perfect, the perfect unhoused person, which, what does that even mean? Um, and so these things are all, uh, connected in a myriad ways. And this connects to things like the criminalization of homelessness, of course, which is something that's ramping up in this country. And I wanted to show people that this is something that affects you as well, because the criminalization of the unhoused, it's kind of like the first they came for aspect, mm -hmm. you know, and if they're criminalizing people for trying to survive in the failing empire, a failing capitalist empire, where does that put any of us? Our tenuous relationship to housing is therefore also a tenuous, a tenuous relationship to legality. And that's something that we have to reckon with. 
And Ellen, are you right in the piece? And this is, you know, contextually very important to to note. And you said, even if you have housing now, you are still likely only one or two emergencies away from being unhoused, like like you were just saying. In the richest country in the world where 16 million homes sit vacant while on any given day, some 650,000 Americans are unhoused, record numbers, you write, and housing is unaffordable to half of all renters in the United States, seems that we're on shaky ground. You do go on to talk about more criminalization of houselessness, uh, cash bail funds, uh, other ways in which houselessness has been uh, criminalize the way in which we see public spaces transformed as exclusionary or somehow um, merely sitting on a bench or, or is trying to take a break somewhere in public is is verboten and we're putting spikes uh, on chairs and things. I mean, it's absolutely lunacy, the degree to which this is gone. And I think it's important to contextually frame it the way in which you did um, that this is something that actually affects way more people than we think. And it has the potential to affect half or more of, of people living in places like the U.S. if there is some unforeseen uh, calamity or tragedy that strikes. And they do. People die. People get sick. People lose jobs. I mean, this is all a pretty normal part of life. Uh, Eleanor, can you, can you uh, address a couple of other things from the, from the piece, particularly, you know, if you want to get into any of the other legal issues or, or particularly maybe some things uh, that you suggest that people might do to raise awareness around this, or um, what are things people can do in their own communities to address these mounting concerns and problems? Sure. Well, Mickey, I think the important thing to note is that so the solutions to this are the solutions that everybody needs, you know, universal health care, no, uh, make housing accessible and affordable. And if people need housing and can't pay for it, they deserve a house. I mean, there are way more empty homes in this country than there are unhoused people. It's not difficult to house them and then uh, make sure that there's an uh, there's accessible services to the people who require them, whether that be physical services, mental health services, what have you. And so the idea uh, that that the solutions to the unhoused is something completely different because they're a different species is like part of the propagandization of how we look at the unhoused in this country. And I think in terms of addressing it wherever you live, because there are unhoused people everywhere. Uh, it really starts with something, and I feel like it, it, it almost feels trite saying this, but recognize the humanity in unhoused people uh, and recognize ways to address, if you can't address the root causes, because most people can't really build a shelter that has access to, to mental health care and physical health care programs, um, address some of the issues that you can, you know, whether that's food, not bombs, or whether that's ensuring that plate people might have a place to stay, or uh, if you live in places that get really cold, make sure that people have supplies. This is what mutual aid has done and will continue to do as the empire continues to fall and more and more people become unhoused. Be one of these civilian reporters who documents this. You know, it's kind of like cop watching. Uh, watch these homeless sweeps and see if, if your presence there might not keep people from being moved or at the very least stop them from being brutalized because that 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 can have that effect. So I think just like with any other issue, it's paying attention. And then what does that attention move you to do? Just like on this show, it's like the news that doesn't make the news and why. And then what does that that what does that push us to do in terms of acting on this information that we then have? Because anybody who has the information of what's really going on, Mickey, I think will feel moved to act. And of course, that's the importance of media literacy and really seeing what's going on in the world. You know, Eleanor, <clears throat> great points. And uh, I thought a good note to to sort of wrap on, you have a note at the end of the piece that I think is really important because I, uh, you know, when, when teaching, you know, sometimes students ask questions about the language we use, right? And, and, and well, why, why, why do you, when they're used to seeing a, an issue framed a certain way in, in the establishment press, the homelessness crisis or how it's how it's attached to all these other bad blight things in in uh, urban areas and so forth <clears throat> the way that it's stereotyped you have a clarifying point that talks about why the term unhoused is used versus homelessness can, can you address that because it's i think it's a significant way of trying to get people to think about things outside the corporate frame through which 
um, you know, again, we, we're back to the United States of realtors, uh, that frame that's just almost automatically accepted. And in, in this way, by kind of reclaiming the language and talking about the term unhoused, you're actually calling attention to something. Could you talk about that briefly? Sure. Yeah. I mean, as as you mentioned, Mickey, the language that we use is hugely important because it shapes the way that we think about things. And the term unhoused uh, refers, it, it emphasizes that those who live on the streets or in their cars uh, do not necessarily lack a connection to place. And this has been used in particular with indigenous communities. They are at home on, in this land and on this land. They do not lack a home. They lack shelter. Uh, this it, People also use the term unsheltered because what's really lacking here is a house, a shelter, something material that the system has an obligation to provide if the system were worth anything. <laughs> um, but homelessness suggests like, oh, these people just don't have a home. They're wanderers, you know, like the old fashioned yeah, term yeah. tramp, like <clears throat> they're just wandering and they've got the little <clears throat> stick with the pack on it. Like it almost, you can almost all of her. But Eleanor, it. they have cars and phones. They're doing, they're choosing. <laughs> Right, right. It's and, and that's the other thing. It's like this Oliver Twist perspective. So when they when people see a, an unhoused person with a phone or with a car, they're like, you're doing fine. And it's like, no, yeah. I never said I don't have a phone. I said I don't have shelter. And yeah. so it's 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 really recognizing the myriad ways in which people who are unhoused uh, present in our communities in our modern day age. So it's not Oliver Twist. And also then recognizing that the way we use the language unhoused means that the 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 obligation to fix it lies on the system and in the system as opposed to homelessness, which just kind of sounds sounds kind of like hippy dippy wanderer. Yeah, well, or the Oliver Twisted logic that if only millennials and Gen Z people would lay off the lattes and avocado toast, they too could buy an <laughs> exorbitantly priced house. Uh, yeah, it's a lot somewhere. of avocado toast, Mickey. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's going to be, it's the, well, you know, you, you got to keep that 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 part of the economy going, I guess. Um, but I think that that's important to call out is that I think that there is a stigma around the, the entire topic. And I think that the language, what you just pointed out is significant. It's important that we understand the language, that we employ the language, um, and that we all do realize. I mean, it, it's, it, 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 you know, it goes way back, you know, going back even to the to the Depression or sooner. Um, you know, Jacob Reese wrote How the Other Half Lives, etc. Uh, it seems like that there's this this uncanny belief among many working folks, even the middle class that, you know, they're just, they're just one break away from being the boss and the millionaire when, when the clear reality starkly is that they're actually just one crisis away from having some really serious challenges. And, you know, the corporate media really helps further that kind of mythology and they really help bury it by talking about it. And they use it as a me me mechanism of fear, Right. That, you know, you, you better go back to that job you hate. You better go and put up with oppression and being mistreated because you don't want to be that blight or that issue or that problem. Right. It, we can't even bring ourselves in the corporate media to talk about people who are unhoused as human beings. And that, I think, is like really what's at the root of the problem. Absolutely. Okay. Eleanor Goldfield, um, that about will wrap it for the segment here. Uh, it's always great to to talk with you. Uh, co-host to co-host about these issues. Do you want to share with uh, our listeners again where where they can find more of your work? Your recent article is at truthout.org, but they can also follow you at? Yeah, all of my work, including links to this show, in case you need a, need a reminder, are up at artkillingapathy.com. Right on. Thanks so much, Eleanor Goldfield, for the Project Censored show. I'm Mickey Huff. To learn more, you can go to projectcensored.org, and we'll see you next time.